everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the DFS card uh, for tomorrow. Um, I'm coming from Vegas with a an early start time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern. And sorry for the late uh, video, but there were several fighters that really didn't even have salaries due to uh, several fight replacements, and we're going to get to that in a minute. I did a, a video on uh, the LOLZ podcast where I just really try to call out a lot of DFS content for not actually teaching people how to win or people how to play um, and just focusing on giving just plays without any context, without any, without any, I don't know, uh, direction of what to do with that, that information uh, on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, part of the reason I do that is to just remember to motivate myself to, to stay on path. And, and with every video that I do, with every bit of content I put out, I have that little check mark that if, if, if what I'm about to put out does not help you get better, not just for the slate, but also in the long run, um, uh, it's probably, I'm probably not going to put it up. Um, and likewise, if I want to give you just some basic concepts. I want to be able to apply it to an actual slate. Um, otherwise, it's not, it's not useful to me. So with that said, I'm going to try to walk that line, but not walk the line. I, I want to give you the information, but make it usable and make it repeatable and, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll just see how this goes. Uh, I know a lot of people appreciate this approach, uh, this kind of method. Some people just want to see who the best plays are and just put my top four plays out there and let's go. But I don't know. I, this is, uh, this is my mission and I'm going to continue doing this. All right. So we do have right now 14 fights. And what that means to us is we can play good plays. In other words, if we're playing the lottery at a big MME contest, 14 fights is enough where you don't have to in you know engage in all kind of funny business. That being, you know, leaving five thousand on the table, uh, doing doing this random geometric mean filtering, which you probably have to do on ten or eleven fight cards if you want to play at all. On fourteen fight cards, you can play the good plays. Now, even with that said, you still want to be cognizant of ownership and you still want to be cognizant of leverage and you still want to be cognizant of those types of fundamentals so as we go through this you know we are going to be looking still for upside right we are going to be looking for leverage but it's just not to, uh, to a degree that is you know commensurate with uh, with 11 and 12 fight uh 12 fight cards so i want to start i guess with with what the core like the obvious plays are just going to look like OK, because until you know what those are, you don't know whether you need to leverage off. Them. So we're going to get to that. So what we're looking for again in DFS is we're looking for you know, guys with a good inside the distance prop relative to their to their salary uh, or a good money line relative to their salary. Um, would be nice if it's a combination of those two you know, relative to their salary. Um, and. In the absence of an inside the distance prop, you want someone that's going to operate with, with a lot of grappling upside, which is rewarded on DraftKings scoring and also at a high pace, um, which uh, also is, uh, is conducive to good volume, which is good um, for DraftKings scoring as well. Um, so I, I'm going to start with, with this one, the, the, the Jonathan Pierce, Joe Anderson, Brito fight, because this, at least to me, seems as though it's the obvious, very, you know, kind of like a pure DFS type of play. Um, you have Jonathan Pierce against Joe Anderson Burrito. We have one, minus 130 versus plus 100. The first thing you always want to check is for line value. Just make sure that there hasn't been some huge line movement that makes this, that, that, that you know, you need to take uh, take note of. But no, you have Burrito at 7,800, Pierce 8,400. So the line is actually very you know, commensurate with that. But both of these fighters have an incredible amount of upside relative to their salaries. You, know, you have Joe Anderson Brito, who, for his price, his inside the distance prop at plus 165, or even with the VIG plus 200, is extremely strong. I mean, in and of itself, that is an extremely strong play. Um, and yet, on the other hand, you have Jonathan Pierce, who um, he does not have the same type of inside the distance prop by a long shot. I mean, he is what? Uh, plus about 200, although it's pretty close, actually. I, well, I didn't realize this. The Pearson side of distance line is very similar to the Brito one, 
And Pierce has that high pace grappling upside, which is also extremely conducive to high scoring. So Pierce is in a completely like an elite play with respect to everything that's good about DraftKings. Um, and I do think that Brito is also a really, really strong play. Now, I would love for one of these guys to have been that much you know, more popular than the other one, because then you can get really good leverage on a pretty good play against a great play, which is something I talk about quite a bit. But aside from that, this does look like the type of fight that you're going to want to just include in your in your main builds. In other words, um, even when you're playing 20 lineups, 30 lineups, 50 lineups, 150, you're going to want a whole bunch of this fight, if not all of it. OK, now you sometimes on a 10, 11 fight card, I would say, you know what, um, it's going to be so popular that you could make a case for fading some of it. Um, but on a 14 fight card, I don't think that's going to be necessary. I think that you can just go ahead and jam this fight um, and, you know, and, and just try to get different elsewhere and try to find uh, high upside plays, uh, uh, you know, uh, that might be lower owned elsewhere. So this is a very, very key fight that you're going to want to get. I would I would think 100 percent of and that's how I would start either my my three max my 20 max my 150 whatever if you're playing say if you're if you're running on saber sim it's probably going to do it for you you don't really have to like lock it in you know and that's 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 the important thing it's like what I'm telling you is probably going to be factored into the projections and the upside and things like that when you run your sims and all that stuff but but just fight over fight this is an extremely strong one. And what I like to do is just kind of put it in here so that I can, we can just know what's going on. So we have Pierce and Brito. And before we even move on, I, I do want to consider, and this is what Nerdy Tenor has done to me. Okay. Nerdy Tenor, for those of you who don't know, he, you know, he, he stacked a three round fight, you know, a couple of months ago and ended up becoming optimal. And so every single, you know, that really usually flies in the face of normal theory. You, know, you don't really want to stack even five man fights in big GPPs and three, three round fights, very, very rare. So it got me thinking to always just check to see if there's any fights that like that, that are like that. And I will say that this fight could be one of those. Like if this were a, a, a slate where, you know, you would want to get a three round, uh, a three round fight stat. I think this fight is very live for that because it's going to be a lot of volume, a lot of stuff going on. And if in fact, this is one of those fights where Brito gets like multiple knockdowns, but Pierce survives, and comes on and gets a sub later or something like that. This this could be this could deliver uh, in that in, you know as a three round stack. But I think that in fourteen fight cards, it's just asking a lot for that to be optimal. But it, I always want to consider it, and so you know just continue to talk about. It. All right. So moving on, another key fight I believe, or kind of a key group of fights, are. The, the fights with the the wrestlers so what that what i'm referring to is the the estevam charles johnson fight the and essentially the aline perez pudelova fight um where you have one fighter who is obviously apparently going to be uh, have a win condition really can that's based on wrestling which is always a good thing to have in dfs right so the first one is the Charles Johnson, Rafael Esteban. You have a money line, which is minus 155. So we expect the, the uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, the price is to be about 8,300 or so. And it's about right. Uh, you actually get a little bit of line value here with Esteban. And the thing is that his win condition is predicated on, on wrestling. Okay. Um, so when he wins, you know, he's probably going to score a good amount. Um, so it's not... A good play because of an inside distance line because let's see what he is is inside the distance is plus 300 which is not good for for that price but because it might come with a lot of wrestling and chain wrestling and, and multiple takedowns he becomes a very very obvious type of dfs play so whenever you have the obvious type of dfs play you want to look and see if the opponent is a good play in and of himself because those are those are usually very very strong dfs plays when, you, when it comes to getting leverage. Um, so we take a look at Charles Johnson. First of all, the pro one problem is he doesn't have a lot of line value, as I mentioned. I mean, he's pretty, he's 8K, which is more conducive or more uh, indicative of a pick and price tag. 
And in addition to that is inside the distance line, let's take a look, is plus one, plus 500. So unfortunately, even though it's a situation where I would love to get some leverage against Esteban here, Charles Johnson is just does not provide good enough metrics. And again, I'm giving him a break. I don't even need the normal smash play type metrics. I just need something. It just doesn't seem to be getting there for me. Um, Lucy Podolova versus Aline Perez. Now, Aline Perez in her last fight, I mean, she had like 100,000 takedowns all right, against, it's obviously a low level older fighter who can't really defend them too well. But you know, that's, you know, it does show that she does have that type of upside. And she also is pretty, very aggressive and very high volume. And this type of fight and this type of fighter is a DraftKings type of fighter, right? So, so you know, she's 175 uh, money line. So I'm expecting her to be about, what, 8,800 8, or something like that. And it's actually only 8,600. So you're getting a little bit of line value maybe. And he, she certainly has the profile of someone who scores well on DraftKings. Um you take a look at her inside the distance line. I mean, it's not that great. Uh, Perez inside the distance plus three hundred. That you know that in and of itself, that's really not that great. I mean, look at Perez. Is this actually right on Betway? You can get her plus six hundred. I don't think that's possible because you can get plus six. No, no, this this is this is an illusion. The plus three hundred is more is is more more accurate. So that is not the greatest. But the presence of the takedowns probably makes up for that. Um, so I think that she, you know, considering that the, she had the takedown upside and a little bit of line value, I think she's a pretty strong play. So again, when you have a strong play, you have to look at the other side and see if Pudelova is even okay. Because everybody's going to see what I see. Everybody's done their tape study. Everybody's reading, looking at content. Everybody is, is running projections, right? And everybody's going to get to Perez as a good play. So if you can find some leverage on the other side with even an okay play, I think that's not bad. So Pudelova, her inside the distance though, boy, oh boy, it's plus 525. I really thought it was going to be a little bit better. Um, as I went into this, this, breakdown i really was boy oh boy i really was expecting to be drawn to the puta loba side a lot more than i am i am going to be playing her i think it's a good idea to play her um in in the in 150 max or or you know in, in the big gbps just because i do think perez is going to be popular but if i'm gonna you know keep it real as the kids say i mean her metrics are not great puta loba um and her money line is not great. So maybe, uh, maybe this is not a great leverage spot after all. But this is, this is the process. This is the way you have to talk through this stuff. If Pudelova had was had any type of, it was better at all, as far as her metrics go, I would think she's really, really good leverage. I just don't think it's good enough. So I'm going to put Perez in kind of like that core group. Um, and so still, I mean, we haven't really found a good piece of leverage. We found great plays so far. Right. I think either Pierce or Brito is good. I think Esteban's good. I think Perez is good. But as I, I thought I was going to get some more Johnson to Pudelova, it just doesn't look like it, they, they fit the bill. All right. Moving on. Uh, is there any other wrestler versus grappler thing that we have to deal with? I mean, you could say that the Nicholas Moda one is, but it's only because Trey Ogden is the only one with the takedown upside. But it's not as if he's getting all kinds of steam because of his takedown upside. Uh, he's kind of a low, you know, low volume, boringish type fighter, and he will go for takedowns. Um, but he's not one of those chain wrestler, you know, types that that we can ignore all of the inside the distance line stuff um, for uh, to to you know to make him a big play. So there's so there's not any more real grappler versus striker matchups to deal with. The the Next one I do want to, to talk about, though, is the big line movement fight. And that was uh, Christian Leroy Duncan and Dennis Tolubi. So what ended up happening is that Christian Duncan was originally supposed to fight Cesar Almeida. And based on those money lines, they priced him at 8500 uh, And he dropped out. Uh, excuse me, his opponent dropped out. 
and Tullulian replaced him, and Duncan is now a minus 500 favorite. So you have 8,500 price salary, and you're a five-to-one favorite. That's extreme line value, and it's essentially, get back to this, essentially a theoretical lock, right? There's a couple of things, though. I mean, you don't really have the inside the distance line yet, so... Uh, I just couldn't wait any longer before I put this out, but I'd have to think that Duncan is going to be a minus 110 inside the distance or something. And even if it's only minus 110, I mean, at 8,500, it's just kind of a lock. And, and, and listen, I've, um, I've struggled with this. Uh, I actually, I really didn't struggle with it. This idea that when you have these money line just smashes, you have to realize that all these guys are going to be really, really high owned. All the projections are going to get to them because the math is just so overwhelming. And you might think that, oh, maybe we should just try to fade that in the name of ownership. I guess, okay? But but what I found is that situations like this, you're probably just supposed to eat the chalk. Um, but uh, we, we do want to take a look at the at the inside the distance line on Tenulian but it just isn't out yet. So I'll give you a little bit of, uh, I will give you some, some guidelines. If you do look at the inside the distance line of um, Tullulian, and it is, she's only 6,800, you know? Uh, do you even need a good inside the distance line at 6,800 when you're going to be uh, going up against one of the top, you know, one of the highest known fighters, not the highest known fighter on the slate? I guess not. I, I guess I guess you do want to play Tullulian as well, just to get the leverage. So what this brings up is, well, what are you supposed to do? Like you told me that Duncan's a lock, and also that Tullulian's a good play against him. Yeah, you know, you, this is this is where you use Saber Sam and you run your stuff and you put the ownership in and see how much you get. But uh, I will say this: that if you run your 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 builds and you get to Tullulian, I wouldn't throw him out. Okay. Um, but I, if I were hand building, if I were playing 20, I, I don't, I think I would give it a shot. I don't know. Duncan is going to be so high owned and for good reason, but he's going to be so high owned that any type of win against him, uh, is just going to go a long way to snapping that thing off. So, uh, I will definitely play, I think I might be all in on this fight actually if you played 80 percent duncan and 20 percent Tullian, you're probably going to be over the field on both because i think duncan is going to be about 60 55 i think Tullian's going to be about 10 uh so i think that that's something you could do so we've already identified now two fights that you could probably go all in on right pierce brito and duncan Tullian. And I know it's, it sucks to have to play Tullulian 20% of him, but I just think the leverage you get on Duncan is just kind of too strong to, to overlook here. Um, all right. So with that said, I mean, now we could just get back to, kind of, I don't want to say calling fight by fight, but I guess that's the best way to deal with this and find out what other plays we can kind of choose from to go along with those kind of like cores. I guess that's the best way to look at it. And I alluded to this one first uh, a little while ago, this Nicholas Moda versus Trey Ogden fight. Um, Mata is minus 130. So I'm expecting about 8,300 or so. And that's what you're getting. So there's no line value there. So for an $8,300 fighter, we're, we for us to make him playable, he's probably going to need about, I don't know, about a plus 200 plus 220 inside the distance line or something like that. And it's pretty good. You know what I mean? Moda plus 185, even with the big plus 200. I think this is pretty reasonable, you know? So I think that Moda is, is definitely somebody that you can include in that, you know, in, in that group of fighters that you should probably be filtering into those, those key fights. And again, you know, you run your, if you, you saber to run your stuff, um, we will, you know, if you get to him, just keep it. I may do a Saberson build closer to lock. We have to see because there's so many different ways you can use it. Uh, you could use the Saber score ranking. You could use the projection ranking. You could use MMA default ranking. Um, but that's that's probably for a different video. Trey Ogden on the other side, 
uh, as I alluded to before, he, he's not going to have a great inside the distance line. It's like plus one, plus three, 320. So for me to play him, he's either got to have significant takedown upside or be getting quite a bit of leverage. And I don't think either of those is, are the case. Like he's, he's got like, you know, he can take people down, but he's also can win this fight just kind of like by staying away and kind of a low volume decision. So I don't think that, that you should rely on him to get wins in that fashion. The other thing is that I don't think Moda is going to be particularly high owned. So you're not really getting so much leverage against him either. So I think that from this fight, Moda is going to be the one that kind of fits the bill. You know, he he's does have good metrics in and of himself and his opponent um, doesn't have a lot to, you know, a lot to fire at. You know, he doesn't have great metrics on his own and he doesn't have a high owned guy to, 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 to target. All right, uh, Lucas Alexander versus Jake uh, Jekka Sarigi. You have a minus 500 favorite. Um, so I'm imagining he's 9,400 or something like that. Let's see what he is exactly. 9,300, which is actually not bad. It's really not, not bad for a minus 500, provided he has a good inside the distance line. Um, so let's take a look at it. He... Is inside the distance line is minus one seventy five, and that's pretty good. I mean, it really is. Um, if if you want to get greedy, I'd love for his round one line to be about plus two hundred. That would be nice. Uh, let's see, uh, Alexander in round one. It's plus two hundred. I mean, that's 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 really not bad. That is really not bad. Um, so I think that as as a spend, I think he's pretty good. Um, let me see my ownerships here. I mean, I haven't really finalized them yet. But if I'm not mistaken, Alexander's not going to be, I mean, I'm not going to say he's not going to be popular, but I don't think he's going to be one of the highest owned. Let me just see. Um, Looking on my other page, I apologize for this. MMA worksheet. I don't even have it up on the screen here. No, I'll, I'll pull it up. Hold on a minute. MMA Hodge. Uh, okay, good. So, according to my sheets right now, yeah, I mean, I do have it at 28%, but that's not that big of a deal. You know, so. Uh, if you want to take a shot at Jekka, he he probably needs to have uh, metrics of his own. You know, he certainly does a good money line. I mean, how how is he going to be? How is he going to be a good play on his metrics? I mean, he probably can't. Let's take a look just for the hell of it. Um, Jekka uh, inside the distance, like plus seven hundred. I mean, if we were dealing with a, a, an opponent that would you know, that was going to be really popular, I would say, yeah, let's take a shot. But uh, in the absence of that, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm doing it. And I don't think you should either. <laughs> I mean, that, this is the way you have to analyze these big underdogs. I mean, if you want to play them, that's fine. But only play them, really, if they have good metrics on their own or if they're against one of the higher own guys, which he's not. Mick Parkin versus Kai Machado. Uh, heavyweights, he's minus 350 compared to plus 285 for Machado. So I'm imagining, again, about 9,200 or so. Take a look. Mm, yeah, 9,200. So for a $9,200 fighter, again, we, we want something similar to that of, you know, to that of uh, Alexander. You know, inside the distance line, a better than minus 110. Hopefully around one at plus 200, or maybe some grappling upside. Let's take a look and see what this is. Parking inside, minus 135, seems reasonable. Um, let's take a look at the round one. I mean, it's not bad, plus 240. That's not bad for, I mean, for round one. Plus the fact that he has some takedown upside, I, mean, I think it's a perfectly reasonable favorite. And when I'm looking at the, at the ownerships again, I mean, again, this is not completely tight yet, but 26%. I mean, that's, that's totally reasonable. We're going to be dealing with guys that are much higher owned, you know, whose metrics are not going to be that much better. So uh, 
Nick Park in 26%. I think it's perfectly fine. Um, and, and again, the same problem is going to be with Machado. Like, like because, you know, because Park is not one of the highest known guys for Machado to be a good play, he's going to have good metrics of his own. And let's just take a look. I mean, the good thing about it, it sees it's 7k and it's 7k. You don't need much. I mean, you only need to have an inside the distance line of about plus 350. I think you actually could get it. Um, no, not quite. Machado inside plus 500. It's just, it's just not worth it. You know, is the money line's not quite good enough considering that Parkin's not going to be that high owned. So I think I'm just going to have to pass. And and again, this is the this is the process that you use to to deal with these underdogs. Like if 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 they have good metrics on their own, great. Otherwise, you know, you either need to be up against one of the higher owned favorites. Jose Johnson versus Chad Ellinger. I, I may have short uh, uh, short shifted you. So might might have short uh, short changed you um, when I talked about the different wrestler versus grappler match, uh, wrestler versus striker matchups. Because I probably should have included this one because Chad Ellinger, his path to victory in this fight is going to be if he gets takedowns. You know, Jose, Jose Johnson's got the reach advantage. He's got the striking advantage and things like that. So probably should have included this one. Um, so let's take a look first at the, at the, just the metrics here. So Johnson is minus 200 versus plus 165. So we're expecting to see, I don't know, about 8,800 or so. Um, let's see. Yeah, 8,700, 7,500. So the line value is, doesn't really exist. But at 8,700, you look at Jose Johnson he needs to have an inside the distance line of about plus 140-ish, maybe. Take a look. Johnson inside the distance is plus 170. That's not bad. I mean, that, that's really not bad uh, at 8,700. Um, so I think he's actually pretty sneaky at night. I only have him at 19% ownership. So I think that's actually pretty, pretty good. And the reason why I bring this up also is because Ellinger, I'm not saying he's going to win, but if in fact he does win, it's going to be because he got the takedowns. And at 7,400, I mean, that's, that's what you want. Okay. So Ellinger inside the distance is probably going to be terrible. Actually, it's not even that bad, like plus 350. So plus 350, Plus takedowns. I mean, I think this is a good. It's actually a really sneaky good fight. Like I think uh, in, in DraftKings, I, mean, I like Ellinger's metrics in and of his in and of themselves look pretty good. As a matter of fact, is he can be really popular. I only see sixteen percent. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I, I think this is actually another good fight that you could include in your in your in your twenty max or in your five in your three max or things like that. And the way you get the way you get to that is you look, you know, you, you see, okay, um, I don't know exactly whether uh, I'll put this in the right way. I don't know exactly whether Ellinger's going to win, but if in fact he does, it's because of his grappling, which means that his he's probably a good play. Um, and Jose Johnson, his metrics are better than I thought, and he's going low owned here, so I think that both these are really really good at GPPs. All right, so we talked about Pearson Brito, and, and another one we probably should have talked about earlier, uh, because of the line value and, and the uh, and the, uh, the the fight movement, I guess, was the Uros Medich versus uh, Oral Buy. So Medich was originally supposed to fight uh, what's his name, Johnny Johnny Park, Johnny something, I forget Johnny Parsons, and they priced him accordingly at eighty nine hundred. So his opponent dropped out, and they replaced him with pretty darn good fighter who is basically who's now favorite over Medic. So unfortunately you now manage at 8,900 who uh, is priced, uh, who is, who is an underdog. So he should really be more like 7,800. So uh, as much as Leroy Duncan was a theoretical lock, a uh, manage is a theoretical fade, right? I mean, you really shouldn't be playing. The only way, I mean, you really can play him is if his, his metrics, even considering these 8,900 are okay, 
Um, because he is going to be low owned. I mean, he's probably going to be 10% owned. I think he's going to be a little higher just because, um, just because people were going to play him anyway. You know, I don't know. Uh, and I think that people remember his last fight. He did get a KO and he is going to be low owned. So this is the way, you know, GTO works. Like people see he's going to be 8%. They'll say, well, you know what? He can still knock the guy out. So I'm going to play him anyway. So maybe he'll get up to more like 13, 14. We'll see. But let's take a look at what his inside the distance line is, if it's even up yet. Yeah, so this is another one that's kind of weird because you have to look and see what his inside the distance line is. I, I can't imagine it being good enough, right? Because if he's plus 120, I'm going to need to have about a plus 140 inside the distance to play somebody at 8,900. So, uh, but remember, because he's going to be low owned, you give him a, a little bit of a break. So, okay. If Manich is inside the distance line, if it comes out at like plus 150 even, okay, maybe take a shot as a low on play. Right? Let's take a look at the oral buy. So he's efficiently priced, right? They 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 waited, which, you know, good on DraftKings for doing that. Um, he settled in at some minus 140, and they gave him a price tag of 8,400, which is pretty accurate. But once again, I mean, even at this late date, we don't really have an inside the distance line. Huh. So I got to give you guys a little bit of guidance to what to do here. Um, first of all, with respect to the grappling, he has shown a little of that, but recently he's been more of a striker. So I would say he does have some upside as far as grappling goes. But with respect to the inside the distance line, I, I think I want to have at least, or at most, I guess, his inside the distance line really needs to be about a plus 200 for me to play him. And the other problem with this, with this play is that Medich is going to be like infinite with no infinitesimally owned because of the line value against him. So it's not as if or our Bali has good value. It's just that Medich has terrible value, which is why Orabi really isn't getting that type of leverage. So I think that Aroba is probably a weak GPP play because of the absence of leverage against Medich. Um, very tricky, very tricky uh, analysis there. Very tricky fight to 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 deal with, especially when you don't even have the inside the distance lines yet. Right. Amanda Hibas versus Lu Luana Pinheiro. Seems like a pretty standard type fight. You know, you have minus 200 favorite, 230. Uh, Pinheiro plus 195. It looks as though the lines are pretty efficient with the DraftKings pricing, 9K, 7,200. So he must for a 9K fighter, I mean, you just got to see if she's minus 110 to finish. Um, if not, then you have to really rely on a whole bunch of takedowns. He bus inside the distance is terrible at plus 325. So for her to be a good play, I mean, you really need like a, a lot of takedowns, okay, with that inside the distance line. Or like have her be extremely low owned. Um, I mean, I have her low owned, but not like – like 10%. I have her like almost 20%. So I think she's probably a fate. I mean, there's just no reason to play her. Her inside the distance line is poor. The takedowns upside is marginal. I mean, it's okay, but it's just marginal. There's no leverage. And there's no ownership gap. So there's just, it's just, that's the way you check these boxes. Uh, Pinheiro at plus 200. Um, I'll, I'll before I even look, I'll say this that if she has an inside the distance line of about plus 300, you know, I'll probably take a shot because that's a good line, good metrics for that price, but only plus like 450 given whatever. I don't know. Wait a minute. So Panero said this is minus 320 here. So if you, but if you count for the big, it's plus 400. All right. You know what? I'll put it this way if you get to them with your Saberson builds your, or your, your optimizer builds, I wouldn't throw her out. And if you want to play her in 20 max, all right, I'll give you permission, okay? The metrics are just about good enough um, because, again, Rebus is not no-owned, right? So you're getting some leverage against her. I think Pinero is going to be probably less owned than Rebus. I have them exact, actually the same. And her inside the distance line is not bad. So, okay, we'll take a shot. Peyton Talbot versus uh, Nick Aguirre, minus 700. And at minus 700, I'm expecting the most expensive fighter on the card, which is, I would imagine, 9,500, something like that. Let's see. 
Yep, 9,500. So at 9,500, like, what do you need, right? 9,500, I mean, you need, it's not enough to have like a minus 120 inside the distance prop or something. You need either take, you need that plus takedown upside or a round one uh, prop of about plus 200, okay? As we talked about with those other 9K guys earlier, um, uh, who are we talking about? Like, like Alexander. You, know, you want a plus 200 at most inside the distance line for 9,500. And again, you can you can make notes of this stuff to have your little, you know, so that, that when you come into future cards, you can use that as kind of check marks, uh, as check marks. Now, again, it depends on the size of the slate, depends on the context of the slate, but those are kind of usually good benchmarks. Um, so Peyton Talbot, let's take a look. I imagine inside of this, it'll be minus 150, minus 185, which is obviously great. But again, finishing him in the second round is not going to work on a 14 fight card. We need a first round knockout to get this done. So let's take a look and see what this is. In the first round, she's, he's plus 200. So it's reasonable. Okay. But compare Talbot in the first round, which is about plus 180, plus 200. And compare that to, say, Alexander, who is inside the first round is what? Uh, Alexander round one. What do we say? It's about the same. And Alexander is 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 cheaper. And I also think that he's going to be lower on. Uh, Talbot, a little bit. I have Talbot about 30%. Uh, Alexander, 28 So I do think that Talbot's okay. But I, I prefer the Alexander side. Um, given the various, you know, given the various metrics. Um, now, uh, the other side of this, unfortunately, you know, it just doesn't win often enough. The only way I would play him, the, uh, the opponent, is if, again, if Talbot was going to be like 50, 60% owned, which he's not. So uh, I'm just not going to get to the 7-1 to underdog here. All right, we have a couple of more. We have Jordan Levitt versus Chase Hooper. All right, so a little bit of uh, caution here. Throw this out there. Uh, Jordan Levitt's wife is almost in labor, and he's come out and said that if she goes into labor during fight, fight night, he will be dropping out. So keep in mind that that is a possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying you should run your projections based on this, but I'll just say this, that if you play either fighter from this fight, and it in fact gets postponed, you're really not allowed to want because you were informed of this before. Yeah. Um, all right. So with that said, it just seems like I get kind of a standard type of fight because we don't really know who's going to do the grappling here. Uh, I would imagine Levitt would be more inclined to go for the grappling, but Hooper can do it, do it too. So I don't think that either of them has the, you know, the, the explicit win condition of the grappling just governing the, the, the day. So we're just gonna be looking at the regular money lines and inside the distance props. Um, Hooper minus 220, I mean, again, he's probably be about 9K and he's, he's only, I don't know, 8,800. I guess that's reasonable. Um, I wouldn't say it's real money line value, but at least it's something. With respect to the inside the distance lines, we have, Hooper plus 200. I mean, that's just not good enough at his price. You know, um, you need to have probably like a plus 150, plus 160. Now, we did throw up a lot of volume in his last fight. Um, but that doesn't happen all the time. I mean, Ho Hooper has, you know, if you watch a bunch of Hooper's fights, they're, they take on very different <laughs> different forms. Like last fight, he went after, uh, what's his name? I forget his name. For Jer not for Jerry. Uh, Crap. Uh, and I forgot. You can, you can look up in two seconds. And it put on a lot of volume on him and got in scrambles and didn't really go for takedowns, but actually got taken down himself. Nick Fiero, Fiore. But the, the fight before that, he got into a striking match and got the got the crap beat out of him, you know? And then a couple of fights before that, he just was losing and did a heel hook at the end of the fight to win. So you can't really predict which way the Hooper side is going to go. Um, so I think that Hooper is probably more of a fade for me. And He's a 27% ownership. Um, 
I don't know. I, I'm probably going to end up under on that. It's just the metrics just don't support it, honestly. Um, again, you can run these through that you're optimized to see what you get, but I just can't imagine that being the case. Um, all right, then Levitt. Levitt only looks to be at 18% on, so that's something. And the fact that Cooper is going to be that popular, I mean, what do, what do Levitt's fights look like when he wins? Or does it even matter? I mean, can we just deal with a Levitt decision? Is that good enough? First of all, let's take a look. I imagine it's inside the distance. It's like plus 1,000 here. So plus 460? I don't know. Between that and the fact that he can get takedowns and the fact that Hooper is going to be popular, I think that this is part of your pretty, your, part of your underdog pool. I kind of like him here. Um, I wouldn't play all this fight. As a matter of fact, I prefer him to the Hooper side. All right. Um, boy, this has been going on for a while. So, uh, again, this is what happens when you try, try to get in depth with other strategies. Um, all right. Michael Morales versus Jake Matthews. Michael Morales minus 330. And... I imagine he should be about 9,300 or so. Uh, 9,100, which is pretty reasonable. And, you know, his last fight, he did put on a clinic, sort of, but he really didn't score. Um, I remember listening on to this uh, commentary of this fight. He had the whole fight under control, but he really didn't do anything. I shouldn't do it. He was fine. He had the whole fight taken care of. He didn't score. So got to be careful with guys like this now he scored well in his last two fights but that was because it was a one-round ko with a knockdown and a reversal right this guy got a reversal and a knockdown and a first round thing that's how he got to his 118 and a few good he got two knockdowns you know that's how he got to his 100 so doesn't seem the profile is the guy you want to play night pay 9100 for but I'll, I'll i'll take a look let's take a look at the inside the distance line uh, this can't be very good, right? I guess it's not bad. Inside the distance, minus 120 or 110 both sides. I guess it's better than I thought. Um, let's take a look at his round one. All right, so it's a little worse. So so Morales round one is like more like plus 300 compared to those other guys. So I definitely think that Morales is a little worse. And again, he's a little bit cheaper. Um, so I would, again, probably wouldn't get to him in 20 or three max or handle stuff. I'm not going to X him out of the of player pools when I run my builds, but I mean, it doesn't look like that great for play. And on the other side, Matthews, well, I will also say that Morales looks like 36% owned. I mean, no way. I, I can't, I, I don't, I don't think I can do that. It's how, how is, how is he a better play than Talbot, for example? I mean, he's more expensive Talbot. How is he a better play than Lucas Alexander? I, I hate to say this, but I think that that Mick Parkin might almost be as good of a play. Uh, boy, oh boy, that's uh, that's really interesting. Anyway, um, Jake Matthews on the other side. Uh, I think I just said everything you need to know. That, that boy, oh boy, Morales is really going to be thirty five percent. All right, so this is what I would say right, again. When you run, when you use your saber sim to run your builds, you're going to come up with, you know, you're going to get this anyway. But if you're just kind of gazing at my sheets and, and gazing at ownership and trying to build here, and you could do worse than playing Jake Matthews. He's three to one to win against the guy who's thirty six percent owned, and he's probably going to go for takedowns. I mean, his inside the distance line is great, but boy, oh boy, I don't know. It sounds, it looks good to me. And then in the main event, Brandon Allen versus Paul Craig. So he's minus 400, Brandon Allen. His price is 9,400. And he's going to be 40% owned, about. So what do you need to play a guy like him? You, got, you really need some good shit. <laughs> it's a turn of phrase. I mean, he's got to not only get him out of there, He's got to get him out of there fast with either with takedowns or with knockdowns or something. I mean, I'm listen, I'm sure his inside the distance line is through the roof, right? Um, Brandon Allen round, inside the distance. It's like minus 300. So yeah. Okay. 
So he's probably going to finish him. But what is a what does a second round finish look like as far as scoring goes? What does a third round finish look like as far as scoring goes? I don't know. At, at, at 40% owned? owned? I just think he's a play. You know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't lock him in or anything like that. I think that all these other guys in the price range at lower ownership have just as much upside. You want to know the truth. And Paul Craig, you just you just have to play him. I mean, I, again, I, for those of you that are that are new to this, I mean, again, like you have the highest owned fighter on the slate. Okay. Uh, you always want to try to find a reason to, to go against him. And here, as opposed to some of these other fights where you're doing like plus 700 underdogs, he's only minus, he's only plus 300 to win or something like that. So about 20, 20, 25% of the time, he's going to win anyway, regardless of his method of victory. And you're going to get leverage against all the Brandon Allen ownership. So you have to play this, but not only that, but he's got like legit paths to high scores because of his style. I mean, he's, he's a submission dude. Um, and not only that, but I think he knocked the guy out in his last fight. Uh, did he get a knockout over, over, uh, that, that grappler dude or Muniz or was it a, whatever it was. I mean, he finishes his, his wins. So, uh, you, I think in GPPs, this is a man, this is mandatory. You just have to do it. Um, you could play Brandon Allen. Sure. But if you play Brandon Allen, I would make sure that, that every other piece of your lineup was low owned. Okay. And again, you could, you know, run the Sabres and have this happen automatically. But if you were doing single, you know, handle stuff, I would think that uh, that's what you should, uh, that you should probably make sure you play some Paul Craig. So just to kind of review again, okay. So this is, a, that was a lot. If he fights, well, there's that money line fight, right? The Tului and Duncan. And then I think the high action fights but, but between, well, the Estevan fight, I think whether you play him or not is important. I think that Eileen Perez, whether you play him, her or not, it's important. And I think that that uh, Pierce fight is something you really want to get. So just to remind everybody, Pierce, Brito, uh, wait, the Johnson, Joe Johnson and Ellinger fight, that could be somewhat interesting. You want me to do a, can I do a Saberson build now? You know, I can't only because um, because it's not on sim mode yet. It was, they're kind of late getting their sims together. So I can't really sim the, the results based on ownership. So it's kind of useless. But uh, if you want more information, how do you Saberson? Like go there or go to my QDFS site where we use Saberson all the time. And um, aside from that, this was a shitload. I apologize, but I, I think that we did a good job of analyzing this stuff. Stay tuned later. We're going to do a betting breakdown, which is a lot different and a lot more fun, where we don't rely on these odds. We kind of presume that they're that they're all wrong. But until then, uh, really good card, 14 fights, 2 p.m. Uh, good luck, everybody.